The Rough Riders by President Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 2 To Cuba. Up to the last moment, we were spending every ounce of energy we had in getting the regiment into shape. Fortunately, there were a good many vacancies among the officers, as the original number of 780 men was increased to 1,000, so that two companies were organized entirely anew. This gave the chance to promote some first-rate men. One of the most useful members of the regiment was Dr. Rob Church, formerly a Princeton football player. He was appointed as assistant surgeon, but acted throughout almost all the Cuban campaign as the regimental surgeon. It was Dr. Church who first gave me an idea of Bucky O'Neill's versatility, for I happened to overhear them discussing Aryan word roots together, and then sliding off into a review of the novels of Balzac, and a discussion as to how far Balzac could be said to be the founder of the modern realistic school of fiction. Church had led almost as varied a life as Bucky himself, his career including incidents as far apart as exploring and elk hunting in the Olympic Mountains, cooking in a lumber camp, and serving as doctor on an immigrant ship. Woodbury Kane was given a commission, and also Horace Devereux of Princeton. Kane was older than the other college men who entered in the ranks, and as he had the same good qualities to start with, this resulted in his ultimately becoming perhaps the most useful soldier in the regiment. He escaped wounds and serious sickness, and was able to serve through every day of the regiment's existence. Two of the men made second lieutenants by promotion from the ranks while in San Antonio were John Greenway, a noted Yale football player and catcher on her baseball nine, and David Goodrich, for years captain of the Harvard crew. They were young men, Goodrich having only just graduated, while Greenway, whose father had served with honor in the Confederate Army, had been out of Yale three or four years. They were natural soldiers, and it would be well-nigh impossible to overestimate the amount of good they did the regiment. They were strapping fellows, entirely fearless, modest, and quiet. Their only thought was how to perfect themselves in their own duties, and how to take care of the men under them, so as to bring them to the highest point of soldierly perfection. I grew steadily to rely upon them, as men who could be counted upon with absolute certainty, not only in every emergency, but in all routine work. They were never so tired as not to respond with eagerness to the slightest suggestion of doing something new, whether it was dangerous or merely difficult and laborious. They not merely did their duty, but were always on the watch to find out some new duty which they could construe to be theirs. Whether it was policing camp, or keeping guard, or preventing straggling on the march, or procuring food for the men, or seeing that they took care of themselves in camp, or performing some feat of unusual hazard in the fight, no call was ever made upon them to which they did not respond with eager thankfulness for being given the chance to answer it. Later on I worked them as hard as I knew how, and the regiment will always be their debtor. Greenway was from Arkansas. We could have filled up the whole regiment many times over from the South Atlantic and Gulf states alone, but were only able to accept a very few applicants. One of them was John McElhaney of Louisiana, a planter and manufacturer, a big-game hunter and book lover, who could have had a commission in the Louisiana troops, but who preferred to go as a trooper in the Rough Riders because he believed we would surely see fighting. He could have commanded any influence, social or political, he wished, but he never asked a favor of any kind. He went into one of the New Mexican troops, and by his high qualities and zealous attention to duty, speedily rose to a sergeantcy, and finally won his lieutenancy for gallantry in action. The tone of the officer's mess was very high. Everyone seemed to realize that he had undertaken most serious work. They all earnestly wished for a chance to distinguish themselves and fully appreciated that they ran the risk not merely of death, but of what was infinitely worse, namely, failure at the crisis to perform duty well. And they strove earnestly so to train themselves and the men under them as to minimize the possibility of such disgrace. Every officer and every man was taught continually to look forward to the day 
of battle eagerly, but with an entire sense of the drain that would then be made upon his endurance and resolution. They were also taught that, before the battle came, the rigorous performance of the countless irksome duties of the camp and the march was demanded from all alike, and that no excuse would be tolerated for failure to perform duty. Very few of the men had gone into the regiment lightly, and the fact that they did their duty so well may be largely attributed to the seriousness with which these eager, adventurous young fellows approached their work. This seriousness, and a certain simple manliness which accompanied it, had one very pleasant side. During our entire time of service, I never heard in the officer's mess a foul story or a foul word. And though there was occasional hard swearing in moments of emergency, yet even this was the exception. The regiment attracted adventurous spirits from everywhere. Our chief trumpeter was a Native American. Our second trumpeter was from the Mediterranean, I think an Italian, who had been a soldier of fortune not only in Egypt but in the French army in southern China. Two excellent men were Osborne, a tall Australian who had been an officer in the New South Wales Mounted Rifles, and Cook, an Englishman who had served in South Africa. Both, when the regiment disbanded, were plaintive in expressing their fond regret that it could not be used against the Transvaal Boers. One of our best soldiers was a man whose real and assumed names I, for obvious reasons, conceal. He usually went by a nickname which I will call Tennessee. He was a tall, gaunt fellow with a quiet and distinctly sinister eye, who did his duty excellently, especially when a fight was on, and who, being an expert gambler, always contrived to reap a rich harvest after payday. When the regiment was mustered out, he asked me to put a brief memorandum of his services on his discharge certificate, which I gladly did. He much appreciated this and added in explanation, You see, Colonel, my real name isn't Smith, it's Yancey. I had to change it because, three or four years ago, I had a little trouble with a gentleman and, er, well, in fact, I had to kill him. And the district attorney, he had it in for me, so I just skipped the country. And now, if it ever should be brought up against me, I should like to show your certificate as to my character. The course of frontier justice sometimes moves in unexpected zigzags. So I did not express the doubt I felt as to whether my certificate that he had been a good soldier would help him much if he was tried for a murder committed three or four years previously. The men worked hard and faithfully. As a rule, in spite of the number of rough characters among them, they behaved very well. One night, a few of them went on a spree and proceeded to paint San Antonio red. One was captured by the city authorities, and we had to leave him behind us in jail. The others we dealt with ourselves in a way that prevented a repetition of the occurrence. The men speedily gave one another nicknames largely conferred in a spirit of derision, their basis lying in contrast. A brave but fastidious member of a well-known Eastern club who was serving in the ranks was christened Tough Ike, and his bunkie, the man who shared his shelter tent, who was a decidedly rough cowpuncher, gradually acquired the name of The Dude. One unlucky and simple-minded cowpuncher, who had never been east of the Great Plains in his life, unwarily boasted that he had an aunt in New York, and ever afterward went by the name of Metropolitan Bill. A huge red-headed Irishman was named Sheeny Solomon. A young Jew who developed into one of the best fighters in the regiment accepted, with entire equanimity, the name of Pork Chop. We had quite a number of professional gamblers who, I am bound to say, usually made good soldiers. One, who was almost abnormally quiet and gentle, was called Hell Roarer, while another, who in point of language and deportment was his exact antithesis, was christened Prayerful James. While the officers and men were learning their duties and learning to know one another, Colonel Wood was straining every nerve to get our equipment, an effort which was complicated by the tendency of the Ordnance Bureau to send whatever we really needed by freight instead of express. 
Finally, just as the last rifles, revolvers, and saddles came, we were ordered by wire at once to proceed by train to Tampa. Instantly, all was joyful excitement. We had enjoyed San Antonio and were glad that our regiment had been organized in the city, where the Alamo commemorates the death fight of Crockett, Bowie, and their famous band of frontier heroes. All of us had worked hard, so that we had had no time to be homesick or downcast. But we were glad to leave the hot camp, where every day the strong wind sifted the dust through everything, and to start for the gathering place of the army, which was to invade Cuba. Our horses and men were getting into good shape. We were well enough equipped to warrant our starting on the campaign, and every man was filled with dread of being out of the fighting. We had a pack train of 150 mules, so we had close on to 1,200 animals to carry. Of course, our train was split up into sections, seven all told, Colonel Wood commanding the first three and I the last four. The journey by rail from San Antonio to Tampa took just four days, and I doubt if anybody who was on the trip will soon forget it. To occupy my few spare moments, I was reading M. de Molin's Superiote des Anglo-Saxons. M. de Molin's, in giving the reasons why the English-speaking peoples are superior to those of continental Europe, lays much stress upon the way in which militarism deadens the power of individual initiative. The soldier being trained to complete suppression of individual will, while his faculties become atrophied in consequence of his being merely a cog in a vast and perfectly ordered machine. I can assure the excellent French publicist that American militarism, at least of the volunteer sort, has points of difference from the militarism of continental Europe. The battalion chief of a newly raised American regiment, while striving to get into a war which the American people have undertaken with buoyant and light-hearted indifference to detail, has positively unlimited opportunity for the display of individual initiative, and is in no danger whatever either of suffering from unhealthy suppression of personal will or of finding his faculties of self-help numbed by becoming a cog in a gigantic and smooth-running machine. If such a battalion chief wants to get anything or go anywhere, he must do it by exercising every pound of resource, inventiveness, and audacity he possesses. The help, advice, and superintendence he gets from the outside will be of the most general, not to say superficial, character. If he is a cavalry officer, he has got to hurry and push the purchase of his horses, plunging into and out of the meshes of red tape as best he can. He will have to fight for his rifles and his tents and his clothes. He will have to keep his men healthy largely by the light that nature has given him. When he wishes to embark his regiment, he will have to fight for his railway cars exactly as he fights for his transport when it comes to going across the sea, and on his journey... His men will or will not have food, and his horses will or will not have water and hay, and the trains will or will not make connections in exact correspondence to the energy and success of his own efforts to keep things moving straight. It was on Sunday, May 29th, that we marched out of our hot, windy, dusty camp to take the cars for Tampa. Colonel Wood went first with the three sections under his special care. I followed with the other four. The railway had promised us a 48 hours trip, but our experience in loading was enough to show that the promise would not be made good. There were no proper facilities for getting the horses on or off the cars, or for feeding or watering them, and there was endless confusion and delay among the railway officials. I marched my four sections over in the afternoon, the first three having taken the entire day to get off. We occupied the night. As far as the regiment itself was concerned, we worked an excellent system, Wood instructing me exactly how to proceed, so as to avoid confusion. Being a veteran campaigner, he had all along insisted that for such work as we had before us, we must travel with the minimum possible luggage. The men had merely what they could carry on their own backs, and the officers very little more. My own roll of clothes and bedding could be put on my spare horse. The mule train was to be used simply for food, forage, and spare ammunition. As it turned out, we were not allowed to take either it 
or the horses. It was dusk when I marched my long files of dusty troopers into the station yard. I then made all dismount, excepting the troop which I first intended to load. This was brought up to the first freight car. Here every man unsaddled and left his saddle, bridle, and all that he did not himself need in the car, each individual's property being corded together. A guard was left in the car, and the rest of the men took the naked horses in the pens to be fed and watered. The other troops were loaded in the same way in succession. With each section, there were thus a couple of baggage cars in which the horse gear, the superfluous baggage, and the travel rations were carried. And I also put aboard, not only at starting, but at every other opportunity, what oats and hay I could get, so as to provide against accidents for the horses. By the time the baggage cars were loaded, the horses of the first section had eaten and drunk their fill, and we loaded them on cattle cars. The officers of each troop saw to the loading, taking a dozen picked men to help them, for some of the wild creatures, half broken and fresh from the ranges, were with difficulty driven up the chutes. Meanwhile, I superintended not merely my own men, but the railroad men, and when the delays of the latter and their inability to understand what was necessary grew past bearing, I took charge of the trains myself so as to ensure the horse cars of each section being coupled with the baggage cars of that section. We worked until long past midnight before we got the horses and baggage aboard, and then found that for some reason the passenger cars were delayed and would not be out for some hours. In the confusion and darkness, men of the different troops had become scattered, and some had drifted off to the vile drinking booths around the stockyards, so I sent details to search the latter while the trumpeters blew the assembly until the first sergeants could account for all the men. Then the troops were arranged in order, and the men of each lay down where they were, by the tracks and in the brush, to sleep until morning. At dawn, the passenger trains arrived. The senior captain of each section saw to it that his own horses, troopers, and baggage were together, and one by one they started off, I taking the last in person. Captain Caprone had at the very beginning shown himself to be simply invaluable. From his extraordinary energy, executive capacity, and mastery over men, and I kept his section next mine, so that we generally came together at the different yards. The next four days were very hot and very dusty. I tried to arrange so the sections would be far enough apart to allow each ample time to unload, feed, water, and load the horses at any stopping place before the next section could arrive. There was enough delay and failure to make connections on the part of the railroad people to keep me entirely busy, not to speak of seeing at the stopping places that the inexperienced officers got enough hay for their horses and that the water given to them was both ample in quantity and drinkable. It happened that we usually made our longest stops at night, and this meant that we were up all night long, Two or three times a day I got the men buckets of hot coffee, and when we made a long enough stop they were allowed liberty under the supervision of the non-commissioned officers. Some of them abused the privilege and started to get drunk. These were promptly handled with the necessary severity in the interest of the others, for it was only by putting an immediate check to every form of lawlessness and disobedience among the few men who were inclined to be bad that we were enabled to give full liberty to those who would not abuse it. Everywhere the people came out to greet us and cheer us. They brought us flowers, they brought us watermelons and other fruits, and sometimes jugs and pails of milk, all of which were greatly appreciated. We were traveling through a region where practically all the older men had served in the Confederate Army and where the younger men had all their lives long drunk in the endless tales told by their elders at home and at the crossroads taverns and in the courthouse squares about the cavalry of Forrest and Morgan and the infantry of Jackson and Hood. The blood of the old men stirred to the distant breath of battle. The blood of the young men leaped hot with eager desire to accompany us. The older women, who remembered the dreadful misery of war, the misery that presses its iron weight most heavily on the wives and the little ones looked sadly at us. But the young girls drove down in bevies, arrayed in their finery, 
to wave flags in farewell to the troopers and to beg cartridges and buttons as mementos. Everywhere we saw the stars and stripes, and everywhere we were told, half laughing, by grizzled ex-Confederates, that they had never dreamed in the bygone days of bitterness to greet the old flag as they now were greeting it, and to send their sons, as now they were sending them, to fight and die under it. It was four days later that we disembarked in a perfect welter of confusion. Tampa lay in the pine-covered sand flats at the end of a one-track railroad, and everything connected with both military and railroad matters was in an almost inextricable tangle. There was no one to meet us or to tell us where we were to camp, and no one to issue us food for the first 24 hours, while the railroad people unloaded us wherever they pleased, or rather, wherever the jam of all kinds of trains rendered it possible. We had to buy the men food out of our own pockets and to seize wagons in order to get our spare baggage taken to the camping ground which we at last found had been allotted to us. Once on the ground, we speedily got order out of confusion. Under Wood's eye, the tents were put up in long streets, the picket line of each troop stretching down its side of each street. The officers' quarters were at the upper ends of the streets, the company kitchens and sinks at the opposite ends. The camp was strictly policed and drill promptly begun. For thirty-six hours we let the horses rest, drilling on foot, and then began the mounted drill again. The regiments with which we were afterward to serve were camped near us, and the sandy streets of the small town were thronged with soldiers, almost all of them regulars, for there were but one or two volunteer organizations besides ourselves. The regulars wore the canonical dark blue of Uncle Sam. Our own men were clad in dusty brown blouses, trousers and leggings being of the same hue, while the broad-brimmed soft hat was of dark gray, and very workmanlike they looked, as, in column of fours, each troop trotted down its company street to form by squadron or battalion, the troopers sitting steadily in the saddles as they made their half-trained horses conform to the movement of the guidons. Over in Tampa Town, the huge winter hotel was gay with general officers and their staffs, with women in pretty dresses, with newspaper correspondents by the score, with military attaches of foreign powers, and with onlookers of all sorts. But we spent very little time there. We worked with the utmost industry, special attention being given to each troop commander to skirmish drill in the woods. Once or twice we had mounted drill of the regiment as a whole. The military attaches came out to look on, English, German, Russian, French, and Japanese. With the Englishman, Captain Arthur Lee, a capital fellow, we soon struck up an especially close friendship, and we saw much of him throughout the campaign. So we did of several of the newspaper correspondents, Richard Harding Davis, John Fox, Jr., Caspar Whitney, and Frederick Remington. On Sunday, Chaplain Brown of Arizona held service, as he did almost every Sunday during the campaign. There were but four or five days at Tampa, however. We were notified that the expedition would start for destination unknown at once, and that we were to go with it, but that our horses were to be left behind, and only eight troops of seventy men each taken. Our sorrow at leaving the horses was entirely outweighed by our joy at going, but it was very hard indeed to select the four troops that were to stay and the men who had to be left behind from each of the troops that went. Colonel Wood took Major Brody and myself to command the two squadrons, being allowed only two squadron commanders. The men who were left behind felt the most bitter heartburn. To the great bulk of them I think it will be a lifelong sorrow. I saw more than one, both among the officers and privates, burst into tears when he found he could not go. No outsider can appreciate the bitterness of the disappointment. Of course, really, those that stayed were entitled to precisely as much honor as those that went. Each man was doing his duty, and much the hardest and most disagreeable duty was to stay. Credit should go with the performance of duty, and not with what is very often the accident of glory. All this and much more we explained, but our explanations could not alter the fact that some had to be chosen and some had to be left. 
One of the captains chosen was Captain Maximilian Luna, who commanded Troop F from New Mexico. The captain's people had been on the banks of the Rio Grande before my forefathers came to the mouth of the Hudson, or Woods landed at Plymouth, and he made the plea that it was his right to go, as a representative of his race, for he was the only man of pure Spanish blood who bore a commission in the army, and he demanded the privilege of proving that his people were precisely as loyal Americans as any others. I was glad when it was decided to take him. It was the evening of June 7th when we suddenly received orders that the expedition was to start from Port Tampa, nine miles distant by rail at daybreak the following morning, and that if we were not aboard our transport by that time, we could not go. We had no intention of getting left and prepared at once for the scramble which was evidently about to take place. As the number and capacity of the transports were known, or ought to have been known, and as the number and size of the regiments to go were also known, the task of allotting each regiment or fraction of a regiment to its proper transport and arranging that the regiments and transports should meet in due order on the deck ought not to have been difficult. However, no arrangements were made in advance, and we were allowed to shove and hustle for ourselves as best we could on much the same principles that had governed our preparations hitherto. We were ordered to be at a certain track with all our baggage at midnight, there to take a train for Port Tampa. At the appointed time we turned up, but the train did not. The men slept heavily, while Wood and I and various other officers wandered about in search of information which no one could give. We now and then came across a brigadier general or even a major general, but nobody knew anything. Some regiments got aboard the trains and some did not, but as none of the trains started, this made little difference. At three o'clock, we received orders to march over to an entirely different track, and away we went. No train appeared on this track either, but at six o'clock some coal cars came by, and these we seized. By various instruments, we persuaded the engineer in charge of the train to back us down the nine miles to Port Tampa, where we arrived covered with coal dust, but with all our belongings. The railroad tracks ran out on the quay, and the transports, which had been anchored in midstream, were gradually being brought up alongside the quay and loaded. The trains were unloading wherever they happened to be, no attention whatever being paid to the possible position of the transport on which the soldiers were to go. Colonel Wood and I jumped off and started on a hunt, which soon convinced us that we had our work cut out if we were to get a transport at all. From the highest general down, nobody could tell us where to go to find out what transport we were to have. At last we were informed that we were to hunt up the depot quartermaster, Colonel Humphrey. We found his office where his assistant informed us that he didn't know where the colonel was but believed him to be asleep upon one of the transports. This seemed odd at such a time, but so many of the methods in vogue were odd that we were quite prepared to accept it as a fact. However, it proved not to be such, but for an hour Colonel Humphrey might just as well have been asleep as nobody knew where he was and nobody could find him and the quay was crammed with some 10,000 men, most of whom were working at cross purposes. At last, however, after an hour's industrious and rapid search through this swarming ant heap of humanity, Wood and I, who had separated, found Colonel Humphrey at nearly the same time, and we were allotted a transport, the Yucatan. She was out in midstream, so Wood seized a stray launch and boarded her. At the same time, I happened to find out that she had previously been allotted to two other regiments, the 2nd Regular Infantry and the 71st New York Volunteers which latter regiment alone contained more men than could be put aboard her. Accordingly, I ran at full speed to our train, and leaving a strong guard with the baggage, I double-quicked the rest of the regiment up to the boat, just in time to board her as she came into the quay, and then to hold her against the second regulars and the 71st, who had arrived a little too late, being a shade less ready than we were in the matter of individual initiative. There was a great deal of expostulation, but we had possession, and as the ship could not contain half of the men who had been told to go aboard her, the 71st went away, as did all but four companies of the 2nd. These latter we took aboard. Meanwhile, a general had caused our train to be unloaded at the end of the quay furthest from where the ship was, and the hungry, tired men spent most of the day in the labor of bringing down their baggage and the food and ammunition. The officers' horses were on another boat, my own being accompanied by my colored body servant, Marshall, the most faithful and loyal of men, himself an old soldier of the Ninth Cavalry. 
Marshall had been in Indian campaigns, and he christened my larger horse Rain in the Face, while the other a pony went by the name of Texas. By the time that night fell and our transport pulled off and anchored in midstream, we felt we had spent 36 tolerably active hours. The transport was overloaded, the men being packed like sardines, not only below but upon the decks, so that at night it was only possible to walk about by continually stepping over the bodies of the sleepers. The travel rations which had been issued to the men for the voyage were not sufficient, because the meat was very bad indeed, and when a ration consists of only four or five items, which taken together just meet the requirements of a strong and healthy man, the loss of one item is a serious thing. If we had been given canned corned beef, we would have been all right. But instead of this, the soldiers were issued horrible stuff called canned fresh beef. There was no salt in it. At the best, it was stringy and tasteless. At the worst, it was nauseating. Not one-fourth of it was ever eaten at all, even when the men became very hungry. There were no facilities for the men to cook anything. There was no ice for them. The water was not good, and they had no fresh meat or fresh vegetables. However, all these things seemed of small importance compared with the fact that we were really embarked, and we were with the first expedition to leave our shores. But by next morning came the news that the order to sail had been countermanded, and that we were to stay where we were for the time being. What this meant none of us could understand. It turned out later to be due to the blunder of a naval officer, who mistook some of our vessels for Spaniards, and by his report caused consternation in Washington, until by vigorous scouting on the part of our other ships, the illusion was dispelled. Meanwhile, the troop ships, packed tight with their living freight, sweltered in the burning heat of Tampa Harbor. There was nothing whatever for the men to do, space being too cramped for amusement or for more drill than was implied in the manual of arms. In this, we drilled them assiduously, and we also continued to hold school for both the officers and the non-commissioned officers. Each troop commander was regarded as responsible for his own non-commissioned officers and would, or myself, simply dropped in to superintend, just as we had did with the manual of arms. In the officer's school, Captain Caprone was the special instructor, and a most admirable one he was. The heat, the steaming discomfort, and the confinement, together with the forced inaction, were very irksome, but everyone made the best of it, and there was little or no grumbling even among the men. All, from the highest to the lowest, were bent upon perfecting themselves according to their slender opportunities. Every book of tactics in the regiment was in use, from morning until night, and the officers and non-commissioned officers were always studying the problems presented at the schools. About the only amusement was bathing over the side, in which we indulged both in the morning and evening. Many of the men from the far west had never seen the ocean. One of them, who knew how to swim, was much interested in finding that the ocean water was not drinkable. Another, who had never in his life before seen any water more extensive than the headstream of the Rio Grande, met with an accident later in the voyage. That is, his hat blew away while we were in mid-ocean, and I heard him explaining the accident to a friend in the following words, Oh, 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 Jim, my hat blew into the creek. So we lay for nearly a week, the vessels swinging around on their anchor chains, while the hot water of the bay flowed to and fro around them and the sun burned overhead. At last, on the evening of June 13th, we received the welcome order to start. Ship after ship weighed anchor and went slowly ahead under half steam for the distant mouth of the harbor, the bands playing, the flags flying, the rigging black with the custard soldiers, cheering and shouting to those left behind on the quay and to their fellows on the other ships. The channel was very tortuous, and we anchored before we had gone far down it, after coming within an ace of a bad collision with another transport. The next morning we were all again under way, and in the afternoon the great fleet steamed southeast until Tampa Light sank in the distance. For the next six days we sailed steadily southward and eastward, through the wonderful sapphire seas of the West Indies. The thirty-odd transports moved in long parallel lines, while ahead and behind and on their flanks the gray hulls of the warships surged through the blue water. We had every variety of craft to guard us, from the mighty battleship and swift cruiser to the converted yachts and the frail, venomous-looking torpedo boats.
The warships watched with ceaseless vigilance by day and night. When a sail of any kind appeared, instantly one of our guardians steamed toward it. Ordinarily, the torpedo boats were towed. Once a strange ship steamed up too close and instantly, the nearest torpedo boat was slipped like a greyhound from the leash and sped across the water toward it. But the stranger proved harmless and the swift, delicate, death-fraught craft returned again. It was very pleasant sailing southward through the tropic seas toward the unknown. We knew not whither we were bound nor what we were to do, but we believed that the nearing future held for us many chances of death and hardship, of honor and renown. If we failed, we would share the fate of all who fail, but we were sure that we would win, that we should score the first great triumph in a mighty world movement. At night we looked at the new stars and hailed the Southern Cross when at last we raised it above the horizon. In the daytime we drilled, and in the evening we held officers' school. But there was much time when we had little to do save to scan the wonderful blue sea and watch the flying fish. Toward evening, when the officers clustered together on the forward bridge, the band of the Second Infantry played tune after tune until on our quarter the glorious sun sank in the red west, and one by one the lights blazed out on troopship and warship for miles ahead and astern as they steamed onward through the brilliant tropic night. The men on the ship were young and strong, eager to face what lay hidden before them, eager for adventure where risk was the price of gain. Sometimes they talked of what they might do in the future, and wondered whether we were to attack Santiago or Puerto Rico. At other times, as they lounged in groups, they told stories of their past, stories of the mining camps and the cattle ranges, of hunting beer and deer, of war trails against the Indians, of lawless deeds of violence and the lawful violence by which they were avenged, of brawls in saloons, of shrewd deals in cattle and sheep, of successful quests for the precious metals, stories of brutal wrong and brutal appetite, melancholy love tales, and memories of nameless heroes, masters of men and tamers of horses. The officers, too, had many strange experiences to relate. None, not even Llewellyn or O'Neill, had been through what was better worth telling or could tell it better than Caprón. He had spent years among the Apaches, the wildest and fiercest of tribes, and again and again had owed his life to his own cool judgment and extraordinary personal prowess. He knew the sign language, familiar to all the Indians of the mountains and the plains, and it was curious to find that the signs for different animals, for water, for sleep and death, which he knew from holding intercourse with the tribes of the southeast, was exactly like those which I had picked up on my occasional hunting or trading trips among the Sioux and Mandans of the north. He was a great rifle shot and wolf hunter, and had many tales to tell of the deeds of gaunt hounds and the feats of famous horses. He had handled his Indian scouts and dealt with the Bronco Indians, the renegades from the tribes, in circumstances of extreme peril, for he had seen the sullen moody Apaches when they suddenly went crazy with wolfish bloodlust and in their madness wished to kill whomever was nearest. He knew, so far as white men could know, their ways of thought and how to humor and divert them when on the brink of some dangerous outbreak. Caprone's training and temper fitted him to do great work in war, and he looked forward with eager confidence to what the future held, for he was sure that for him it held either triumph or death. Death was the prize he drew. Most of the men had simple souls. They could relate facts, but they said very little about what they dimly felt. Bucky O'Neill, however, the iron-nerved, iron-willed fighter from Arizona, the sheriff whose name was a byword of terror to every wrongdoer, white or red, the gambler who with unmoved face would stake and lose every dollar he had in the world, he, alone among his comrades, was a visionary, an articulate emotionalist. He was very quiet about it, never talking unless he was sure of his listener. But at night, when we leaned on the railing to look at the Southern Cross, he was less apt to tell tales of his hard and stormy past than he was to speak of the mysteries which lie behind courage and fear and love, behind animal hatred and animal lust for the pleasures that have tangible shape. He had keenly enjoyed life, and he could breast its turbulent torrent as few men could. 
He was a practical man who knew how to wrest personal success from adverse forces, among moneymakers, politicians, and desperados alike. Yet, down at the bottom, what seemed to interest him most was the philosophy of life itself, of our understanding of it, and of the limitations set to that understanding. But he was, as far as possible, from being a mere dreamer of dreams. A staunchly loyal and generous friend, he was also exceedingly ambitious on his own account. If, by risking his life, no matter how great the risk, he could gain high military distinction, he was bent on gaining it. He had taken so many chances when death lay on the hazard that he felt the odds were now against him. But, said he, who would not risk his life for a star? Had he lived, and had the war lasted, he would surely have won the eagle, if not the star. We had a great deal of trouble with the transports, chiefly because they were not under the control of the Navy. One of them was towing a schooner and another a scow. Both, of course, kept lagging behind. Finally, when we had gone nearly the length of Cuba, the transport with the schooner sagged very far behind, and then our wretched transport was directed by General Shafter to fall out of line and keep her company. Of course, we executed the order, greatly to the wrath of Captain Clover, who, in the gunboat Bancroft, had charge of the rear of the column, for we could be of no earthly use to the other transport, and by our presence simply added just so much to Captain Clover's anxiety as he had two transports to protect instead of one. Next morning the rest of the convoy were out of sight, but we reached them just as they finally turned. Until this we had steamed with the trade wind blowing steadily in our faces, but once we were well to eastward of Cuba, we ran southwest with the wind behind on our quarter, and we all knew that our destination was Santiago. On the morning of the 20th, we were close to the Cuban coast. High mountains rose almost from the water's edge, looking huge and barren across the sea. We sped onward past Guantanamo Bay, where we saw the little picket ships of the fleet, and in the afternoon we sighted Santiago Harbor, with the great warships standing off and on in front of it, gray and sullen in their war paint. All next day, we rolled and wallowed in the seaway, waiting until a decision was reached as to where we should land. On the morning of June 22nd, the welcome order for landing came. We did the landing as we had done everything else, that is, in a scramble, each commander shifting for himself. The port at which we landed was called Dacquery, a squalid little village where there had been a railway and ironworks. There were no facilities for landing, and the fleet did not have a quarter of the number of boats it should have had for the purpose. All we could do was to stand in with the transports as close as possible, and then row ashore in our own few boats and the boats of the warships. Luck favored our regiment. My former naval aide, while I was assistant secretary of the Navy, Lieutenant Sharp, was in command of the Vixen, a converted yacht, and everything being managed on the go-as-you-please principle, he steamed by us and offered to help put us ashore. Of course, we jumped at the chance. Wood and I boarded the Vixen, and there we got Lieutenant Sharp's black Cuban pilot, who told us he could take our transport right in to within a few hundred yards of the land. Accordingly, we put him aboard, and in he brought her, gaining at least a mile and a half by the maneuver. The other transports followed, but we had our berth and were all right. There was plenty of excitement to the landing. In the first place, the smaller war vessels shelled Dacquery so as to dislodge any Spaniards who might be lurking in the neighborhood, and also shelled other places along the coast to keep the enemy puzzled as to our intentions. Then the surf was high and the landing difficult, so that the task of getting the men, the ammunition, and provisions ashore was not easy. Each man carried three days field rations and a hundred rounds of ammunition. Our regiment had accumulated two rapid-fire Colt automatic guns, the gift of Stevens, Kane, and Tiffany, and one or two others of the New York men, and also a dynamite gun, under the immediate charge of Sergeant Barrow. To get these, and especially the last, ashore, involved no little work and hazard. Meanwhile, from another transport, our horses were being landed, together with the mules, 
by the simple process of throwing them overboard and letting them swim ashore if they could. Both of Woods got safely through. One of mine was drowned. The other, Little Texas, got ashore all right. While I was superintending the landing at the ruined dock with Bucky O'Neill, a boat full of colored infantry soldiers capsized and two of the men went to the bottom. Bucky O'Neill plunging in in full uniform to save them, but in vain. However, by the late afternoon, we had all our men, with what ammunition and provisions they could themselves carry, landed, and were ready for anything that might turn up. Meanwhile, we were purchasing horses. Judging from what I saw, I do not think that we got heavy enough animals, and of those purchased, certainly a half were nearly unbroken. It was no easy matter to handle them on the picket lines and to provide for feeding and watering, and the efforts to shoe and ride them were at first productive of much vigorous excitement. Of course, those that were wild from the range had to be thrown and tied down before they could be shod, Half the horses of the regiment bucked or possessed some other of the amiable weaknesses incident to horse life on the great ranches. But we had an abundance of men who were utterly unmoved by any antic a horse might commit. Every animal was speedily mastered, though a large number remained to the end, mounts upon which an ordinary rider would have felt very uncomfortable. My own horses were purchased for me by a Texas friend, John Moore, with whom I had once hunted peccaries on the Nueces. I only paid fifty dollars apiece, and the animals were not showy, but they were tough and hardy and answered my purpose well. Mounted drill with such horses and men 
bade fair to offer opportunities for excitement, yet it usually went off smoothly enough. Before drilling the men on horseback, they had all been drilled on foot, and having gone at their work with hearty zest, they knew well the simple movements to form any kind of line or column. Wood was busy from the morning till night in hurrying the final details of the equipment, and he turned the drill of the men over to me. To drill perfectly needs long practice, but to drill roughly is a thing very easy to learn indeed. We were not always right about our intervals, our lines were somewhat irregular, and our more difficult movements were executed at times in a rather haphazard way. But the essential commands and the essential movements we learned without any difficulty, and the men performed them with great dash. When we put them on horseback, there was, of course, trouble with the horses, but the horsemanship of the riders was consummate. In fact, the men were immensely interested in making their horses perform each evolution with the utmost speed and accuracy, and in forcing each unquiet, vicious brute to get into line and stay in line whether he would or not. The guidon bearers held their plunging steeds true to the line no matter what they tried to do, and each wild rider brought his wild horse into his proper place with a dash and ease which showed the natural cavalryman. In short, from the very beginning, the horseback drills were good fun, and everyone enjoyed them. We marched out through the adjoining country to drill wherever we found open ground, practicing all the different column formations as we went. On the open ground, we threw out the line to one side or the other, and in one position and the other, sometimes at the trot, sometimes at the gallop. As the men grew accustomed to the simple evolutions, we tried them more and more in skirmish drills practicing them so that they might get accustomed to advance in open order and to skirmish in any country while the horses were held in the rear. Our arms were the regular cavalry carbine, the crag, a splendid weapon, and the revolver. A few carried their favorite Winchesters, using, of course, the new model which took the government cartridge. We felt very strongly that it would be more than a waste of time to try and train our men to use the saber, a weapon utterly alien to them, but with the rifle and revolver they were already familiar. Many of my cavalry friends in the past had insisted to me that the revolver was a better weapon than the sword. Among them, Basil Duke, the noted Confederate cavalry leader, and Captain Frank Edwards, whom I had met when elk hunting on the headwaters of the Yellowstone and the Snake. Personally, I knew too little to decide as to the comparative merits of the two arms, but I did know that it was a great deal better to use the arm with which our men were already proficient. They were therefore armed with what might be called their natural weapon, the revolver. As it turned out, we were not used mounted at all, so that our preparations on this point came to nothing. In a way, I have always regretted this. We thought we should at least be employed as cavalry in the great campaign against Havana in the fall and from the beginning I began to train my men in shock tactics for use against hostile cavalry. My belief was that the horse was really the weapon with which to strike the first blow. I felt that if my men could be trained to hit their adversaries with their horses, it was a matter of small amount whether, at the moment when the onset occurred, sabers, lances, or revolvers were used, while in the subsequent melee I believed the revolver would outclass cold steel as a weapon. But this is all guesswork, for we never had occasion to try the experiment. It was astonishing what a difference was made by two or three weeks' training. The mere thorough performance of guard and police duties helped the men very rapidly to become soldiers. The officers studied hard, and both officers and men worked hard in the drill field. It was, of course, rough-and-ready drill, but it was very efficient, and it was suited to the men who made up the regiment. Their uniforms also suited them. In their slouch hats, blue flannel shirts, brown trousers, leggings, and boots, with handkerchiefs knotted loosely around their necks, they looked exactly as a body of cowboy cavalry should look. The officers speedily grew to realize that they must not be over-familiar with their men, and yet that they must care for them in every way. The men, in return, began to acquire those habits of attention to soldierly detail which means so much in making a regiment. Above all, every man felt 
and had constantly instilled into him a keen pride of the regiment and a resolute purpose to do his whole duty uncomplainingly, and above all, to win glory by the way he handled himself in battle. 